Our most important climatologist, Jim Hansen, had his team at NASA do a study to figure out how much carbon in the atmosphere was too much. The paper they published, maybe the most important scientific paper of the millennia to date, said we now know enough to know how much is too much. Any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. That's pretty strong language for scientists to use. Stronger still if you know that outside today, the atmosphere is 395 parts per million CO2 and rising about two parts per million per year. Everything frozen on Earth is melting. The great ice sheet of the Arctic is reduced by more than half. The oceans are about 30% more acidic than they were 30 years ago because the chemistry of seawater changes as it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. And because warm air holds more water vapor than cold, the atmosphere is about 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago. That's astonishingly large change. There's more energy coming in and being absorbed by the Earth than there is heat being radiated to space, which is exactly what we expected, because as we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, it traps heat. Now we can measure that, and that's the basis by which we can prove that the human-made impacts on atmospheric composition are the primary cause of the climate change that we're observing. So let's get to work. We're calling this do the math, and we're going to do some math for a moment. Just three numbers, OK? I wrote about them in a piece last summer for Rolling Stone, uh, a piece that went oddly viral. It was, the, it was the issue with Justin Bieber on the cover, OK? Um, but here's the strange thing. The next day, uh, I got a call from the editor saying, your piece has gotten 10 times more likes on Facebook than Justin Bieber's, you know? <laughs> some, of that, some of that is doubtless the result of my sort of soulful stare, you know? But, <laughs> but mostly it's because we managed to just kind of lay out this math in a very straightforward way that people needed to understand as we were going through what turned out to be the hottest year that America has ever experienced. Before we get to those three numbers, here's where we are so far. We've burned enough coal and gas and oil to raise the temperature of the Earth one degree. What has that done? There was a day last September when the headline in the paper was half the polar ice cap is missing, literally. I mean, if Neil Armstrong were up on the moon today, he would look down and see half as much area of ice in the Arctic. We've taken one of the largest physical features on Earth and we have broken it. Shall we work through the numbers? They're three, and they're easy. The first one's two degrees. That's how much the world has said it would be safe to let the planet warm. In political terms, it's the only thing that anybody's agreed to. Some of you may remember that climate summit in Copenhagen. There was only one number in the final two-page voluntary accord that people signed. Only one number in it, two degrees. Every signatory pledged to make sure the temperature wouldn't rise above that. The EU, Japan, Russia, China, countries that make their money selling oil like the United Arab Emirates, the most conservative, recalcitrant, reluctant countries on Earth, even the United States. If the world officially believes anything about climate change, it's that two degrees is too much. Second number, scientists have calculated how much carbon we could pour into the atmosphere and have a reasonable chance of staying below two degrees. They say about 565 more gigatons. A gigaton is a billion tons. That's not a perfect chance. That's worse odds than Russian roulette, you know. It sounds like it should be a lot. It is a lot. 565 billion tons of CO2. The problem is we pour 30 billion tons a year in now, and it goes up 3% a year. Do the math, and it's about 15 years before we go past that threshold. So that's sobering news. But the scary number is the third number. The third number was the important one and the new one. And it came from a team of financial analysts in the United Kingdom. 
And what they did was sit down with all the annual reports and SEC filings and things and figure out how much carbon the world's fossil fuel industry, how much they had already in their reserves. And that number turned out to be 2,795 gigatons worth of carbon, five times as much as the most conservative governments on Earth think would be safe to pour into the atmosphere. Uh, it's not even close. I mean, it's uh, you know, five times more. And once you know that number, then you understand the essence of this problem. What the fossil fuel industry is doing is locking us into a future that we can't survive, that humanity cannot survive. And we know this because just at the end of 2012, we heard this from three different conservative sources simultaneously. The World Bank, the International Energy Agency, Price Waterhouse Cooper, hardly a hippie outfit, all told us that if we do nothing but more of the same, if we dig up those reserves, we are headed towards four to six degrees warming Celsius. These numbers show, and I want to be absolutely clear here, these companies are a rogue force. They're outlaws. They're not outlaws against the laws of the state. They get to write those for the most part. But they're outlaw against the laws of physics. If they carry out their business plan, the planet tanks. And we have all the engineers and entrepreneurs we need. The thing that's holding us back above all else is the simple fact that the fossil fuel industry cheats. Alone among industries, they're allowed to pour out their waste for free. Nobody should be able to pollute for free. You can't, I can't, we can't walk out of here and go litter for free. If you do, you get a fine. If you run a small business, you can't just dump all the garbage in the road. You gotta pay to have it hauled away or you get a fine. The only people who can pollute for free are these mega polluters when it comes to carbon. Big oil, big coal. If you get a $25 fine for littering, you're gonna pay $25 more than all of the industrial polluters have ever paid in 150 years for the carbon they've been dumping. That's how whack this whole thing is. It's almost how we define civilization. You pick up after yourself, unless you're the fossil fuel industry, then you pour that carbon into the atmosphere for free, and that is the advantage that keeps us from getting renewable energy at the pace that we need. We should internalize that externality. The only reason we haven't is because it would impair somewhat the record profitability of the fossil fuel industry, and so they have battled at every turn to keep it from happening. These are rogue companies now. Well, once upon a time, they performed a useful social function. For a long time, the U.S.'s engine was fossil fuels like oil and coal to power trains, to power cars, to power industry. In the mid-1900s, we realized that there were consequences. If you look at industries like coal now, we just did a report with Harvard Medical School that showed that if they actually paid for what they're doing to us, what we're paying indirectly for that electricity, coal would cost anywhere from three to far more times its current cost. They would be out of business. And that is just financially and morally bankrupt. When a utility burns coal, it is the cheapest source of fuel. But they're not paying the full price. The externalities, the additional costs to society, to human health, to the environment, are not factored in as a cost of doing business. We subsidize the fossil fuel industries. We are paying them to continue to keep polluting, and this means all kinds of things. It's tax breaks, it's loans, it's the fact that armies protect their pipelines and protect um, their trade routes. You're helping them stay on top and preventing their competitors, like uh, renewable fuels, from competing. What we need is a level playing field. We could be using that public money, taxpayer money, to make the shift to green energy. Occasionally, they will pretend to be seeing the light. Ten years ago, BP announced that their initials now stood for Beyond Petroleum, and they got a new logo. And they put some solar panels on some gas stations, and they invested a tiny bit of money, a 
pittance in solar and wind research. Even that proved too much. Three years ago, they sold off those divisions and said that from now on, they were going to concentrate on their core business, which turned out basically to be wrecking the Gulf of Mexico. Why are they so fixated on hydrocarbons? Because these are the most profitable enterprises in human history. The top five oil companies last year made $137 billion. That's $375 million every day. That's a lot of money. They got $6.6 million in federal tax breaks daily. They spent $440,000 a day lobbying Congress. Rex Tillerson, the head of Exxon, made $100,000 a day. Which, by the way, one of my favorite talking points is that climate scientists make up their findings because they're in it for the grant money, okay? Um, <laughs> The only problem that these companies have now is that the scientists are watching in real time as they pull off this heist, and it's getting harder to deny. In fact, they're beginning to kind of admit what's going on. Last summer, for the very first time, the CEO of Exxon, Mr. Tillerson, gave a speech in which he said, yes, it's true, global warming exists. Clearly, there's going to be an impact, so I'm not, not disputing that Increasing CO2 emissions in the atmosphere is going to have an impact. It'll have a warming impact. But since the only way to stop that would be to take a hit to the company's profitability, he immediately tried to change the subject. It's an engineering problem, and it has engineering solutions. Really? What kind of engineering solutions were you thinking? Changes to weather patterns that move crop production areas around. We'll adapt to that. Look, I mean, all respect, but that's crazy talk. We can't move crop production areas around, okay? Crop production areas are what people in Vermont refer to as farms, okay? <laughs> we already have farms every place that there is decent soil on Earth. It is true that Exxon has done all it can to melt the tundra, but that does not mean that you can just move Iowa up there and start over again. There is no soil. If fossil fuel companies want to change, here's how we'd know they were serious. One, they'd need to stop lobbying in Washington. Two, they'd need to stop exploring for new hydrocarbons. The first rule of holes is that when you are in one, stop digging, okay? And the third thing they'd need to do is go to work with the rest of us to figure out the plan where they turn themselves into energy companies, not fossil fuel companies, and figure out with the rest of us how to keep 80% of those reserves underground. The thing that really does make this almost pathological is the fact that when we already have five times as much carbon we can possibly burn, I mean, Exxon alone, $100 million a day exploring for new hydrocarbons.